1995 was, in many ways, the low point of Cardinals baseball over the last 30 years. Coming off of the player strike, fan interest and attendance were way down, and club ownership did not prioritize the Cardinals' on-field product, and privately they were looking to sell the ball club. The 95 Cardinals on the field were bad, and I don't mean just kind of bad, I mean they were awful. That's not to say they didn't have some decent players. Brian Jordan, Ray Langford, and Bernard Gilkey were all above average in the outfield, and Tom Hankey was outstanding in his only season with St. Louis, but an injury to Ozzie Smith limited the Wizard to just 44 games. And offseason additions Ken Hill, Danny Jackson, and Scott Cooper were major busts. The club also reneged on a handshake agreement they had with Todd Zeal concerning a new contract, and this prompted Zeal to request a trade. You want to know how bad things were going for the 95 Cardinals? Trip Cromer somehow got 369 at-bats. Oof. By June, it was pretty obvious that the Cardinals were going nowhere in 95. And so, on the 15th of that month, with the club sitting at a 20-27 and 27 record, Cards GM Walt Jockety dropped the hammer. The day started when the club fired manager Joe Torrey and replaced him with longtime organizational guy Mike Jorgensen. The day ended when the club made a very rare trade with the Chicago Cubs, fulfilling Todd Zeal's request to be traded, sending the disgruntled first and third baseman to the north side in exchange for Mike Morgan. A quick side note about Joe Torrey here. The man really did not deserve to be fired in this instance. I mean, you simply cannot expect a person to win when you are given the talent that he was given with the Cardinals. In fact, if you look at the records of the Cardinals in 91, 92, 93, Torrey was a bit of a miracle worker. A little over a month after the Cardinals fired Torrey and traded Zeal, the club dealt Ken Hill to the Indians, which effectively waved the already raised white flag. The team finished out the year with a 62-81 and 81 record, nearly 20 games under 500, despite the fact that they only played 143 contests in 95. The offense, which really was hurting after the departure of Greg Jeffries, finished dead last in the National League in hits, runs, batting average, on-base percentage, slugging percentage, OPS, and total bases. That's pretty gross. Things were looking about as ugly for the Cardinals as the AstroTurf and the blue walls at Bush Stadium. But all that was about to change. I believe in, uh, in, in high goals. I believe in big dreams. And I want us, as early as possible, to get to September 1st with a chance to win. The La Russa hiring came on the heels of the previous day's announcement that Anheuser-Busch would be selling the Cardinals to an investment group headed up by Bill DeWitt Jr., whose father had owned the Reds and the Browns during his lifetime. Now, the sale would not be finalized until the middle of 1996, but that did not stop the Cardinals from going on a bit of a shopping spree. The first major acquisition of the offseason would be shortstop Royce Clayton in a trade from the San Francisco Giants. Needing a major upgrade at third base, the Cardinals signed Gary Gaetti, who had hit a career-high 35 home runs with the Royals in 95. Cardinals fans got an early Christmas present on December 23rd, when the club announced the signings of both Andy Bennis, who had split the 95 season between the Padres and the Mariners, and Ron Gant, who had had an all-star campaign in his only season with the Reds, helping to lead them to the NL Central Division title. Having spent most of the 95 campaign with La Russa in Oakland, Rick Honeycutt had ended the 95 season with the Yankees, and it was from them that the Cardinals purchased his rights. Among the other former A's to join the Cardinals were Todd Stottlemyre, Mike Gallego, Dennis Eckersley, and our old friend Willie McGee, who had spent the 1995 season with the Red Sox. Also returning to St. Louis from that Boston club was Luis Alisea. The team also added catcher Pat Borders and traded Bernard Gilkey to the New York Mets. To say that the Cardinals won the 95-96 offseason would be an understatement. Not only did they get new ownership, not only did they bring in new talent, but they renovated Bush Stadium, returning to natural grass for the first time in a quarter century. They also added green walls, getting rid of that awful blue color, added Homer's Landing, a child's play area, and a couple of other new amenities to make the Bush Stadium experience far more fan-friendly. With all of these changes came high expectations. So, of course, the Cardinals came out of the gate blistering hot in 96, tearing through every one of their National League opponents. Okay, okay not so much. In fact, through their first 25 games, the 96 Cardinals were 12-13, and 13, which was only one game better than the 95 team had been at the same point. On May 19th, the Rockies completed a three-game sweep of the Redbirds in Colorado, leaving the Cardinals at 17-26, and 26, nine games below 500, and in last place. Andy Bettis was not pitching well, the team chemistry just really hadn't come together yet, and to make things worse, tensions between the club and manager Tony La Russa were kind of high. After two world championships and a third NL pennant under his watch in St. Louis, 
it's easy to forget that when Tony first came to St. Louis, he was not beloved by fans. There were a number of reasons for this, one of them being the fact that La Russa was considered an American League guy coming over to the National League. Another one was the fact that he was an outsider. You know, he didn't grow up in New Athens, Illinois, the way that Whitey Herzog had. He wasn't somebody that had a track record at the Major League level of playing for the Cardinals the way that Joe Torre did. This was a guy from California who was an animal rights guy, who was a vegetarian, who did all these weird bullpenning moves and had a very abrasive, non-folksy personality on the surface, and it just wasn't what Cardinals fans were used to. They had not dealt with that kind of intensity from their manager, honestly, ever. But the biggest reason the Cardinals fans were slow to warm to TLR was because of a rift between two players that were very popular with Cardinals fans at the time, shortstop Ozzie Smith and first baseman John Mabry. In case you were unaware of what happened in the La Russa smith feud, in spring training of 96, La Russa said that the shortstop position was going to be an open competition and that whoever played better between Clayton and Smith was going to get the majority of the starts, and by all statistical measures, Ozzie Smith had a far better spring than Royce Clayton. But when it came time for the season to start, La Russa gave the majority of the starts to Royce Clayton anyway. There was plenty of blame to go around on both sides for this feud that is still going on today, La Russa should not have said that it was going to be based purely on spring training statistics, and Ozzie Smith should have been a hell of a lot more graceful about accepting the fact that when you're 40 years old, you're just probably not going to be an everyday shortstop anymore. But of course, that is not what happened, and La Russa's presence was a huge reason why Ozzie Smith announced on June 19th that he would retire at the end of the season. Now, as for the Mabry and La Russa feud, this one is 98% Tony La Russa's fault. In a July 22nd game against the Braves at Bush Stadium, the Cardinals had a big lead, but unfortunately, they wound up blowing that lead in the 7th and the 8th innings. In the 7th inning, Braves superstar Fred McGriff hit a single and was at first base with John Mabry, and Mabry and McGriff were kind of fraternizing. They were joking around. They were laughing with each other. And all this while the Cardinals were slowly seeing their lead slip away. La Russa was not happy about this. Now, I completely understand that sentiment, but the way that La Russa handled it after that situation was pretty grotesque. He chewed Mabry out in the dugout. He chewed Mabry out in the clubhouse in front of his teammates. It was just bad. Despite the slow start and the issues with Tony La Russa, the Cardinals came together as a unit in mid-June and really began to play good baseball, certainly the best baseball Cardinals fans had seen since the mid-1980s. There was no one particular thing the 96 Cardinals were great at. They were right around the middle of the pack in virtually all measurable categories, but the whole was greater than the individual parts. I don't think anybody that watched the 96 Cardinals on a daily basis would say that that was a great team, but that was a good team, and it was a fun team. Of course, fun only counts for so much in baseball, and if you don't make the playoffs, you can have all the fun in the world, you're not going to come home with a ring. But the Cardinals played in the mediocre National League Central Division. They went 10-3 against the awful Pirates, and they went 11-2 against the second-place Astros. And on the strength of that interdivisional record, they grabbed 88 wins and their first-ever Central Division title, and their first berth in the playoffs since 1987. The Cardinals' first-round matchup was against the San Diego Padres. And in 1996, the playoff format for the Division Series was 2-3, meaning that the team with the better record had the first two games on the road and the final three games at home. This would actually prove to be an enormous advantage for the Cardinals as they got to begin the series at their home ballpark. In Game 1, Gary Gaetti staked Cardinals starter Tom Stottlemyre to a 3-0 lead with a home run off of Padre starter Joey Hamilton in the bottom of the first. Stottlemyre pitched well, giving up five hits and only a solo home run to Ricky Henderson, as far as runs go, in six and two-thirds innings. Rick Honeycutt went two-thirds of an inning, and the Eck came on in relief of Honeycutt, going one and two-thirds for his first-ever National League postseason save. Game two was a back-and-forth affair, with Andy Bennis squaring off against his former teammate Scott Sanders. The game was scoreless into the bottom of the third when Willie McGee singled home Luis Alisea. The Padres tied the game in the fifth on a Ken Caminiti solo home run, and in the bottom of that inning, an Andy Bennis single sparked a three-run rally capped off by a bases-clearing double by Ron Gant to make it four-to-one cards. In the top of the sixth, Tony Gwynn singled home his brother Chris, and Willie McGee's throwing error allowed Henderson to score, cutting the lead to one. In the eighth, the Padres tied the game on an RBI groundout by Steve Finley, but in the Cardinals' half of the inning, they returned the favor, regaining the lead on a slow Tom Pagnozzi groundout. Eckersley worked a 1 2 3 ninth, and the Cardinals had a two games to none lead heading to San Diego. Donovan Osborne started game three for St. Louis, opposite Andy Ashby. The Cardinals took an early lead in the first on an RBI single by Brian Jordan before Osborne surrendered two runs in the second and single runs in the third and the fourth. 
In the sixth, the Cardinals tied the game on a Gantt solo homer, a rare triple by Mabry, and a single by Pagnozzi. The Redbirds took the lead in the seventh when Ron Gantt grounded into a bases-loaded double play that scored the go-ahead run. The Padres, though, would tie the game in the bottom of the eighth on a home run by 96 NL MVP Ken Caminiti, but Brian Jordan, as he had done all year, came through in the pinch for the Cardinals, hitting a solo home run in the top of the ninth that proved to be the difference. Eckersley came on, got the save, and the Cardinals' date with the Braves in the National League Championship Series was set. Going into the NLCS, nobody gave the Cardinals any chance whatsoever to dethrone the mighty Braves. And with good reason. The Braves were the defending world champions. The Braves had three all-stars and future Hall of Famers heading up their rotation. And the Cardinals, I mean, they won 88 games. And in the division series, it's not as if though they steamrolled the Padres. They won three close ball games that honestly could have gone either way. But that's the beauty of postseason baseball. And in hindsight, the narrative of the Cardinals in the NLCS against the Braves is that, well... There's no way that you were going to beat Maddox, Glavin, and Smoltz some combination of four times. But no matter how superior the Braves were to the Cardinals, and they clearly were, the Cardinals had a three games to one lead in this series. And while it's understandable losing three times in a row to Maddox, Glavin, and Smoltz, I still firmly believe the Cardinals could have and probably should have won this series. Many people point to this exuberant celebration after their comeback victory in Game 4 as the reason why the Cardinals ultimately lost the series. But in reality, there were a couple of things the Cardinals did that really shot themselves in the foot and set them up to be bitterly disappointed. One of them was the way that Tony La Russa set up his starting rotation for Games 5, 6, and 7, and the other, which I never hear talked about, was the Cardinals' performance in Game 1. So let's start with that Game 1 performance. Early on, things were going the Cardinals' way. In the top of the second, Brian Jordan hit a triple and then scored on a wild pitch to Gary Gaetti. Of course, one run does not allow you very much margin for error, but fortunately for the Cardinals, Andy Bennis was actually outpitching Smoltz this night. With two outs in the top of the fifth, the eighth-place hitter Luis Aliseo worked a walk, and then the pitcher, Andy Bennis, batting ninth, did the same. This was the first time all night that the Cardinals had put consecutive guys on base, and I mean Smoltz had just walked the 8th and ninth place batters, so you were very hopeful that something good was going to happen. Unfortunately, on the second pitch of his at-bat, Ozzie Smith popped up into shallow right field. In the bottom of the fifth with two outs and Jeff Blauser at first, Marquise Grissom hit a ball into the hole at short. In his heyday, Ozzie Smith probably would have knocked this ball down and held Grissom to an infield single. Instead, it ricocheted off his glove, went into left field, which allowed Blauser to go to third, Grissom to go to second, and then a first-pitch fastball to Mark Lemke was hit into the right center field gap, which scored two runs and gave the Braves their first lead of the night. The game would remain 2-1 to one into the seventh, when Gary Gaetti led off for the Cardinals in the top half of the inning with a broken bat single. Miguel Mejia then ran for Gaetti, and the very next batter, John Mabry, hit a single into center field, which allowed Mejia to move to third base, giving the Cardinals runners at the corners with nobody out. Tom Pagnazzi followed Mabry's single with a little bloop dinker of his own, which tied the game at two and gave the Cardinals a great opportunity to take the lead, having runners at first and second with nobody out. This was the first time that Smoltz had really struggled with his command all night. He had been behind on every single hitter in the top of the seventh inning, and so Leo Mazzone came out to make sure that his pitcher was all right. The Braves got some activity up in their bullpen for the first time all game, and the Cardinals had a couple of different options. They could have pinch hit for Luis Alisea, who was due next. They could have let him hit for himself. They could have had him bunt. They could have hit and run. La Russa opted to let Alisea hit for himself. And on the first pitch that he sees... After having just watched Smoltz fall behind every single batter in the half inning, Alisea chases a pitcher's pitch and flies out to left field. A lot of people were really upset with Tony La Russa at the time for not having Alisea bunt there, but I think that Tony was in the right, considering the fact that if Alisea had gotten a base hit, you would have been able to keep Andy Bennis in the game, and Bennis was dealing. It made all the sense in the world to me to have Alisea swing away. Unfortunately, he didn't have a very good at-bat. At that point, La Russa had no choice but to pinch hit for Andy Bennis, and pinch hitter Willie McGee, just like Alisea, swung at the first pitch and flew out to left field. In the span of two pitches, the Cardinals went from having first and second and nobody out to having first and second and two out. I understand that La Russa always preached an aggressiveness in RBI situations philosophy, but don't you need to take a pitch or two there? I mean, you have Smoltz on the ropes, and you just let him off in two pitches. I mean, give Smoltz credit for making those pitches, but the Cardinals, they just really needed to have better at-bats there from Alisea and McGee. The next batter, Ozzie Smith, saw a ball that was called a wild pitch, should have been ruled a pass ball, go by him, which allowed runners to move to second and third, and oh, wouldn't it have been nice if they had actually had runners there in the first place. 
But that too went for naught as Smith hit a one-hopper to the shortstop Blouser who got Smith by half a step and the Cardinals had officially squandered a golden opportunity. It would not be the last moment of frustration St. Louis would experience on this night. Mark Petkaisek, there's a name you haven't heard in a while, came on in relief of Bennis and worked a perfect seventh inning. But in the bottom of the eighth, he walked the leadoff man Mark Lemke. That brought up Chipper Jones. 30-30 guy, Chipper Jones. Guy who finished second in the NL Rookie of the Year voting the year before Chipper Jones. And the Atlanta Braves opt to have him bunt. If you're the Cardinals, this is a gift. I don't give a crap if it is 1996 and everybody still believes that if you have a runner on first base late in the ballgame, no matter who's batting, you need to bunt them over into scoring position. This is a situation where the Cardinals were being given an out during a Chipper Jones at bat. I mean, what would you rather have? Chipper Jones swinging the bat or Chipper Jones bunting? Um, I'd rather have Chipper Jones bunting if I'm the team on defense. Unfortunately, baseball is a cruel bastard. Jones butted the ball off the front of the plate. Peck Isaac stumbled as he went to retrieve it. Then he made a not-so-great throw, which Alisea was unable to handle, and that allowed Lemke to go over to third. So now the Braves had runners at the corners and nobody out, and the Cardinals were in a world of trouble. Tony Fossis was brought in to face Fred McGriff, and on his second pitch, Chipper Jones stole second, which put runners at second and third. Fortunately for the Cardinals, Fossis was able to induce a pop-up to the left side from McGriff, which gave the Cardinals a little bit more wiggle room, but they were still in trouble with the dangerous Klesko up next. Except that the Braves decided, in that very old-school baseball way, that they would be better off trying to force Tony La Russa's hand and get Fossis out of the game by pinch-hitting for the 34-homer 21 double Ryan Klesko with ancient Mariner Terry Pendleton. This is not 1991 NL MVP Terry Pendleton we're talking about. This is the guy who started the year in 96 with the Marlins, came over to the Braves in a trade, and in only 177 plate appearances with Atlanta, was able to accumulate a negative 1.3 wins above replacement. This is a below-average player, and you are taking out one of your best power threats to put him in the game. Thank you! Thank you a thousand times over! And how do the Cardinals repay this? By walking him intentionally to load the bases! I fully understand that that move was right in line with baseball thinking at the time, but I'm sorry, under no circumstances am I loading the bases, even in ancient baseball thinking land, by walking 1996 Terry Pendleton. Of course, T.J. Matthews hung a slider to Javi Lopez, who hit a two-run single in the center field, which gave the Braves a 4-2 lead, and they would ultimately win by that score, taking the Cardinals down quietly in the ninth and gaining a 1-0 advantage in the best-of-seven NLCS. I'm in no way saying that the Cardinals were guaranteed to win if they had come through in some or all of those situations that I highlighted in this game, but it was just so frustrating to watch the Cardinals fail to take advantage of virtually all the opportunities that the Braves gave them to win this game, and there were plenty of them. And I know a lot of it had to do with old-school baseball thinking and just the way the game was played at the time, but the Cardinals on this night should have had a better performance on the whole. Fortunately, the next three games would be a little bit more kind to the Cardinals. Game 2 saw Greg Maddox face off against Todd Stottlemyre. In the top of the 7th, after the Cardinals had just regained the lead at 4-3, the Braves opted to intentionally walk Brian Jordan to load the bases, and for the second night in a row, intentionally walking the bases loaded came back to burn the team that chose to do so, as Gary Gaetti hit Maddox's first pitch over the left field wall for a grand slam, giving the Cardinals an 8-3 lead, and they would win by that score, tying the series at a game apiece, heading to St. Louis. Game 3 saw one of the few holdovers from the Tory era start for St. Louis, Donovan Osborne, opposite Tom Glavin, the 91 Cy Young Award winner. In the top of the first, the Braves took a 1-0 lead on a sacrifice fly off the bat of Chipper Jones. That lead would be short-lived, however, because in the bottom of the first, with a runner on, up came Mr. Ron Gant. In case you don't know the history between Ron Gant and the Atlanta Braves, Gant came up through the Braves system. Gant actually starred for them in the early part of the 1990s, but following the 1993 season, the Braves released Gant when he was involved in a motorcycle accident, and Gant was really hurt by this. He wound up taking a two-year deal with the Reds and rehabbed the entire 94 season, but then had a really good year in 95 before his Reds were swept in the NLCS by the Atlanta Braves. Gant had struggled in that NLCS, hitting only a buck 88 with one run batted in. So in this series, he was looking for both revenge and redemption, and he got a little bit of both when he hit a two-run home run off of Tom Glavin to give the Cardinals a 2-1 lead in the bottom of the first. In the sixth inning, with the score still 2-1, Mr. Gant hit another home run off of Mr. Glavin, this time to dead center field, making it 3-1 St. Louis, and that lead would hold as the Cardinals took a 2-1 lead in the NLCS. 
Before we get into Game 4, I just want to make the comment that Game 4 of the 96 NLCS is one of my all-time favorite Cardinals postseason games. Regardless of how the series came out, it was an amazing contest. The game saw Andy Bennis starting on three days rest against Denny Nagel. In the top of the second, Ryan Klesko hit a solo home run to make it one to nothing Braves. In the top of the sixth, Mark Lemke of all people took Bennis deep to give the Braves a 2 to nothing lead. Later in that same inning, with T.J. Matthews now pitching, Jermaine Dye hit an RBI single to make it 3-0 Braves. In the seventh inning, Denny Nagel was on cruise control. There were two outs and nobody on base when John Mabry hit a harmless single into right field, or so it seemed at the time if you were a Braves fan. Pags was up next, and he had a great at-bat working a full-count walk, which spelled the end of the night for Nagel. The Braves brought in Greg McMichael, a changeup specialist, to pitch to pinch hitter Dimitri Young. The only reason that Dimitri Young was taking this at bat instead of Ray Lankford, who had started the game on the bench, was because Lankford was dealing with an injury and Larusa didn't feel comfortable sending him up to the plate. But Dimitri Young had a great at bat, helped, I'm sure, by this inside information about the movement of McMichael's changeup from former teammate of McMichael's Ron Gant. The end result was an exciting, dramatic triple off of the left center field wall, which scored two runs and put the tying run at third base with two outs. The Cardinals had life when it looked like they were completely dead and that this series was as good as tied. After Luis Alisea walked, Royce Clayton was able to hit a chopper that he beat out for an infield RBI single, tying the game at three and giving the Cardinals a brand new ball game in the seventh. The Braves did not score in the top of the eighth, but in the bottom half, Brian Jordan hit a hanging changeup into the left field bullpen off of Greg McMichael, who for whatever reason was still in the ball game, and the Cardinals had a four to three lead and were three outs away from a three games to one series advantage which they would get in the top of the ninth when Eckersley closed the door on the Braves and continued what wound up being the best postseason of his career, and the Cardinals were one win away from their first trip to the World Series since 1987. Before we get into the actual events of games 5, 6, and 7, we need to talk a little bit about how Tony La Russa mismanaged the starting rotation for the final three games of that series. Going into the series, the rotation lined up to have Andy Bennis in Game 1, Todd Stottlemyre in Game 2, Donovan Osborne in Game 3, and then Alan Bennis in game number four. But when it actually came time for game number four, La Russa decided to move Andy Bennis into that slot and have him pitch on three days rest. The gamble paid off as the Cardinals came back and dramatically won game four. But when it came time for game five, La Russa, in my opinion, got a little bit greedy. He decided to try and go for the throat by sending Todd Stottlemyre out on three days rest in game number five. I have several problems with this. You now are forcing Alan Bennis, a rookie, to make a start on the road in Game 6 instead of having him pitch in a comfortable home environment. Not only that, but you are having your two best starters, at least by 1996 statistical considerations, in Andy Bennis and Todd Stottlemyre pitch on consecutive days on short rest. That means that you're not going to have either one of them available to start on regular rest in either Game 6 or Game 7. To me, it would have made so much more sense to have Alan Bennis pitch at home in game number five and then have Stottlemyre on full rest in game number six. And then if you got to game number seven, you could have either had Andy Bennis on short rest again or you could have had Donovan Osborne throw. Osborne did wind up pitching game seven and that did not go well. And to be quite honest, I still don't understand why he didn't start Andy Bennis in game seven. I mean, if you were willing to start him on short rest in Game 4, why weren't you willing to start him on short rest in Game 7, especially considering the fact that he's the one who was first up out of the bullpen when Donovan Osborne could not get out of the first inning in Game 7. I can't say for sure that the reason that the Cardinals lost the NLCS in 96 was because of that mismanagement of the starting rotation, but it certainly did not help. As I mentioned earlier, Todd Stottlemyre started for the Cardinals on three days rest in Game 5, and he clearly did not have it. By the end of the first inning, the Braves had a 5 to nothing lead. By the end of the second, they were up 7 to nothing. By the end of the night, they were up 14 to nothing and ran away with Game 5 in a laugher. In one-plus innings, Stottlemyre gave up seven runs. And for all the optimism the Cardinals fans felt the night before, if we were being honest with ourselves after this game, I think we kind of knew it was over. Nobody thought the Cardinals were better than the Braves in the first place, and when you have a chance to take them down and you don't do it, and you've gambled with your starting rotation and it didn't pay off, eh, probably not going to be your year. Game 6 was a 3-1 to loss, as Greg Maddox actually pitched very well, but so did Alan Bennis. Kind of makes you wonder what might have happened if he'd have gotten to start Game 5 at home, huh? Alan Bennis pitched five innings, giving up only two runs, and the Cardinals had cut it to a one-run lead for the Braves in the top of the eighth, 
when Ron Gant flew out with a time run at second base, and that was really the last whimper the Cardinals had offensively in the entire series. The Braves tacked on a run on the 8th and set up a decisive Game 7 the following night. If you want to know how bad Donovan Osborne looked for the Cardinals before he even took the mound in Game 7, longtime trainer Gene Gieselman described him as, quote, a guy that if he were a horse, you'd shoot him. By the time Tom Glavin came to bat with the bases loaded in the bottom of the first, the Braves already had a 3 to nothing lead, and as soon as Glavin hit this line drive that Ron Gant dove and missed, I knew as a 10-year-old, shit, they're not winning this game. And in fact, the only reason I stayed up to watch the end of it was because I knew that it was going to be Ozzie Smith's last appearance in a Major League ballpark as an active player. It was just a sad night all the way around. There was really no reason to smile this entire ball game. The Cardinals got their ass handed to them 15 to nothing, which means that over the course of the final three games of the series, they got outscored 32 to 1. It's one thing to lose three games in a row to three future Hall of Fame starting pitchers, and it's another thing entirely to get bludgeoned to death the way the Cardinals did. I mean, it was just downright embarrassing. And while the 96 Cardinals became the third team in franchise history to blow a three games to one postseason series lead, I will always have a soft spot for them. It's a Cardinals team that rarely, if ever, gets talked about, and whenever they are mentioned, it's always in the context of them blowing that three games to one NLCS lead. But all of that ignores the fact that this was the rebirth of the Cardinals, or at least the beginning of it. This was the first step that would make the Cardinals a prominent, if not dominant, team in the National League for the next two decades. This was the Cardinals team that got the ball rolling. And this was the Cardinals team that, going into 1997, people had a lot of optimism about. After upgrading at second base by signing free agent Delano de Shields, the Cardinals were picked by many to win the National League Central Division in 97, and manager Tony La Russa guaranteed during that spring that that is exactly what would happen. Of course, things did not go quite as planned for La Russa and the Cardinals in 97. Injuries severely limited the playing time for both Tom Pagnozzi and Brian Jordan, and the Cardinals' pitching staff was in such shambles that they traded for Fernando Valenzuela, who made five starts for them and was just plain awful. The 97 Cardinals got off to a slow start, but found themselves tied for first place on July 4th, despite the fact that they were two games under 500. But the Cardinals' record, which at the end was 16 games below 500 with the team finishing in fourth place, seemed rather inconsequential to Cardinals fans by the time that September started. And the reason was because the Cardinals, on July 31st, had made a trade with the Oakland Athletics, sending T.J. Matthews, Blake Stein, and Eric Ludwig to the A's in exchange for Mark McGuire. McGuire would be with the Cardinals for four and a half years, and in that time, he would break home run records and become a beloved figure in St. Louis. The McGuire trade's impact, both short and long term, cannot be overstated, and we're going to do a deep dive on that in our next video. As always, thanks for watching and have a good day.